All right, kia ora. Ko jau, me mokoli tēnei. This is a video abstract for um, our latest paper out in the New Zealand Journal of Ecology. Um, conservation programs around the world that are aiming to protect native fauna by controlling small invasive mammals generally assume that the removal of any one individual of a given species is going to have the same effect as removal of another individual of the same species. So think a stoat is always a stoat, right? Um, but internationally within larger bodied carnivores, so think things like bears and wolves, um, there's actually quite a strong amount of variation at times in the amounts of different prey consumed by individuals of the same species. And the same idea has been touted in New Zealand. Um, I, I call it the bad egg hypothesis, the idea that uh, an individual predator might become sort of honed in on one prey type and be responsible for a large amount of the damage. But uh, traditionally this has been a, a really challenging thing to study. You can't follow a stoke round with a notebook. Here we use a biochemical tool to assess the degree with which individual stoats become um, specialised within the dietary niche. So um, we assess the range of chemical signatures of isotopes and the, the larger the chemical signatures pretty much tells us a little bit about the larger the range of prey items regularly consumed by that animal, the larger the, the dietary niche. And we do this for um, three populations of stoats, so for the dietary niche of the population as a whole, but also for each individual stoat at um, three different sites in the alpine zone up, up there um, of three national parks in the South Island of New Zealand. And what we found was that at two sites, at Fiordland and Aspiring, um, stoats were, had a relatively um, small and consistent dietary niche. Uh, whereas at our other site, at Nelson Lakes National Park, they were exploiting a far wider range of, of resources. But, and here's the kicker, right? That each individual stoat wasn't eating a wider range of things. There was no significant difference between the, the size of the dietary niche of individuals. It was just um, at the population level. So each individual specialising in different areas of the dietary niche, um, collectively expanding the buffet. Now, rat abundance was inversely aligned with the size of the population niche, dietary niche. And there was a bunch of other things that were different between our sites as well. But looking through the literature, it allowed us to kind of form this, um, this theory that perhaps in this ecosystem, rats are acting as the optimum dietary niche. So the core, the core prey, primary prey. And that, so when there's rats there, stoats are eating rats and a little bit of these other things around the side. So a little bit of birds and lizards and invertebrates, but the primary prey is rats. Whereas when those other primary prey are absent, perhaps the stoats, um, the dietary niche expands with a whole lot of different stoats um, specialising in different areas of the dietary niche. So um, it's kind of like this. If there's, if there's pizza at the party, we all eat pizza. Who doesn't love pizza? Like optimum party food. We might nibble at the chips and things around the edge, but really pizza, where it's at. If there's no pizza at the party, then you might eat the chips, I eat the celery sticks and pizza on the cheese rolls. So we're all acting as individual specialists within a broader dietary niche. Every, each one of us is focusing on a smaller area, but collectively we're eating a wider range of things. But why not a wider range of things? Why is each individual stoat still focusing on a small range of things when clearly as a species they could be eating a wide range of things? And that's a, a really interesting question. There could be a whole lot of different drivers there. It could be a, a genetic thing, it could be size. Um, different stoats go for different size prey items. It could be, a, say, a boldness spectrum that some stoats take more risk than others. Um, or it could be due to what's called a limited prey recognition library that there's sort of a um, a really ideal number of things you can um, focus on in your mental sort of search image and that above a certain number you become less efficient. So, um, But mainly we want to know how do we use this information to um, better protect native species and I think um, as ecologists if we can um, start to think not just about the uh, numerical ecology of how many stoats are in the environment but also start to be thinking about the behavioural ecology of, of what's happening within that environment and within that that stoat behaviour that will also affect the risk to native species. Um, and particularly we should be aware of um, when primary prey sources are absent that perhaps the, the risk to secondary prey will, will be elevated. 
Um, we should also start thinking about the individual specialist. How does, how does that knowledge that each individual stoke sometimes is acting as individual specialists affect how we do things? And so perhaps um, some variation into things like trapping and baiting regimes wouldn't go amiss. A massive amount of thanks goes to the people that have helped a really huge amount with this study. Um, literally, trappers put dead stoats in their packs and carried around for days and sent them to me in the mail. So um, this could have happened without you and many other volunteers and other people who helped along the way. So cheers. The hope is that um, this research helps you do what you do better. Um, we're always keen to hear comments and critiques, criticisms, great, um, and collaborations. Um, the paper is online, free, and open source right now at the New Zealand Journal of Ecology website. So cheers. Happy trapping.